I'm indeed appreciative of the opportunity to stand before you on this beautiful Lord's Day. I think you would have to be living under a rock to miss the fact that this world is continuously degrading from the standpoint of biblical morality. Perfect, perfect example of that would be recent events. Thankfully, our court system has at least some wits about them in overturning Roe versus Wade. Now look at the response to that. People are protesting that it is now illegal for them to murder their children. But this is nothing new. The world at large has typically shunned biblical principles, especially morality. And this has been a trend throughout all of man's history. We can see, certainly throughout my lifetime here, I've seen the decline, biblically, morally speaking, of those around me. No doubt others who have been here longer have seen the same and even worse. Many today would scoff at anyone attempting to uphold biblical morality. Not only teaching it, but living it out in their own lives. But as Christians, biblical morals must be taught and must be seen in our conduct, in our manner of living. One area of morality that is severely lacking today comes in the form of pornography. Now, I would say that many of us, if not most, potentially all of us, have been exposed to this to one extent or another. Unfortunately, pornography has ensnared most of our society, most of our culture, and the world at large. You see it as a huge money-making business, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think it will be around for quite some time, and I think that'd be stating the obvious. Even those, even some claiming to be members of the church, have fallen victim to this great snare. Even schools claiming to be somewhat Christian, such as Fried Hardman, use pornographic material in their books for teaching art class. Though unfortunate, it should not surprise us that people do these things. After all, problems in the world eventually make their way into the church. You see, pornography is one of Satan's many devices, and unfortunately he has been quite successful in drawing many to his side. But as Christians, we need to know exactly what we're dealing with and how to properly fight against it. We must be able to show forth the truth found in God's word regarding any subject, but particularly the subject of pornography as we will study in the next few moments. As with anything, it's a good idea to define the terms that we're using. So just what is pornography. After these next few minutes, you'll know more than some of the Supreme Court justices. Webster's Dictionary defines pornography as the depiction of erotic behavior as in pictures or writing intended to cause sexual excitement. Secondly, it says materials such as books or photographs that depicts erotic behavior. Now that gives a good idea, but obviously we're more interested in what the Bible has to say about such things. Well, consider the following Greek terms. If you break down the word pornography, it's a compound word. Grapho refers to writing. And porne, which you'll find 12 times in the New Testament, is a Greek, or obviously it's a Greek term, but it's a feminine form. It's translated eight times as the word harlot, 
and four times as the word whore. Pornos appears ten times, and it is the masculine form. Five times it's seen as the word fornicators, and the other five times it's translated as whoremongers. Pornographos, then, literally translated, writing about prostitutes. Then we see the term porneia. This term appears 26 times in the King James Version. And each time it is translated fornication. And fundamentally means harlotry. Figuratively, it means idolatry. Then pornuo, which appears eight times in the New Testament, is rendered commit fornication. And then ek pornuo, which is seen only once, and this is found in Jude 7, which means to be utterly unchaste. There it's rendered giving themselves over to fornication. And this is, of course, referring to those inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Thus, pornography is associated with prostitution and fornication. Pornea is the one and only biblical reason that Jesus gives for man to put away his wife, to divorce his wife. Matthew chapter 9, or 19, verse 9. When God described the filthy, polluted Roman Empire, he chose to call her Porne, or the great whore. And the mother of harlots. Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 and 5 respectively. Now consider some thoughts about pornography from the ancients. It says the Greek word porneia refers to prostitution. With the related terms porne and pornos. Referring to female and male prostitutes respectively. In ancient Athens prostitution was legal and was taxed although it was considered both illegal and shameful for freeborn citizens. Thus, in speaking to discredit a rival, the Athenian orator and politician Apollodorus charged his enemy's partner, Naira, with being a poor name. And this comes from Demosthenes against Naira. In another famous case, Aeschines pro uh, prosecuted his opponent, Timarchus, for prostitution, arguing that a man who sold his body for profit could never be trusted with the affairs of the city. You see, during this time, many thought it was despicable to engage in prostitution, yet others still participated in it. Look around. We have not advanced very far regarding this subject. Though pornography is taboo for many, it remains popular to the majority. It's typically done in private. People are ashamed to talk about it in public unless they know that you too participate in such activity. Nowadays, we attempt to call pornography an expression of art. Schools do this frequently, even those claiming to be having a Christian background. As we've already said, Fried Hardman does the same thing. And then we go a couple steps further in trying to justify it by using First Amendment protections. It's just the right of free speech. As Christians living in this world, we must understand the evils around us. But we also must be able to defend ourselves against them. And as a result, be able to defend ourselves against such evil. Next, I would like for us to consider some statistics regarding pornography and even their effects of it. Now this is all secular data. Uh, I found most of this information on webroot.com. They have the following to say about it. The societal cost of pornography are staggering. The financial cost to business productivity in the US alone is estimated 16.9 billion dollars annually. But the human toll, particularly among our youth and our, in our families, is far greater. According to Dr. Patrick F. Fagan, 
psychologist and former deputy assistant uh, health and human services secretary, quote, two recent reports, one by the American Psychological Association on hypersexualized girls and the other by the National Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy on the pornographic content of phone texting among teenagers make it clear that the digital revolution is being used by younger and younger children to dismantle the barriers that channel sexuality into family life. Pornography hurts adults, children, couples, families, and ultimately society. Among adolescents, pornography hinders the, develop the development of a healthy sexuality, and among adults, it distorts sexual attitudes and social realities. In families, pornography use leads to marital dissatisfaction, infidelity, separation, and divorce. When we consider pornography, the accessibility of such comes up. The amount of pornographic material available on the web is staggering. As introductory economics, search engines, and other online data Reports tell us the market for such material is just as large. Every second, every second, 28,258 users are watching pornography on the Internet. Every second. 3, 000, just over $3,000 is being spent on Internet pornography. Every second. Now, every day, 37 pornographic videos are created just in the United States. 2.5 billion emails containing pornographic material are sent or received. And 68 million search queries related to pornography are generated, which consists of about 25% of the total searches. 116,000 of those queries related to child pornography. Now, as these studies have found, pornography hurts teenagers and young adults. We'll expand on that concept now. <clears throat> First off, it increases the odds of teenage pregnancy. Teenagers with frequent exposure to sexual content on TV have a substantially greater likelihood of teenage pregnancy. And the likelihood of teen pregnancy was twice as high, a doubles when the quantity of sexual content exposure within the viewing episodes was high. Go figure. Secondly, it hinders sexual development. Pornography viewing by teenagers disorients them during the developmental phase of their life when they have to learn how to handle their own sexuality and when they are the most vulnerable to uncertainty about their sexual beliefs and moral values. I would pause here and state, why, don't you, why do you think that these people are attacking the children trying to push their transgenderism? That's exactly why. When you alter the developmental stages of anybody, specifically young adults, you can alter their whole life. And that is exactly what they know and that is exactly what they're doing. And third, it raises the risk of depression. A significant relationship also exists among teens between frequent pornography use and the feelings of loneliness, including major depression. Then we consider the damages wrought upon the family and marriage in general. The negative effects of pornography do not end after development. They can be just as harmful to families and marriages. Again, continuing with the, the website information that I've found. According to Nas or the National Coalition for the Protection of Children and Families in 2010, 47% of families in the United States reported the use of pornography in their home. Pornography use increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%. Marriage is difficult enough. Why would you make it more difficult? Pornography does just that. 40% of people identified as, quote, sex addicts 
lose their spouses. 58% suffer considerable financial losses and roughly 33% lose their jobs. 68% of divorce cases involve at least one party meeting a new paramour, which I had to look that up. That's a fancy term for adulterer or adulteress. Over the internet, while 56% involve one party having, quote, an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. It's destructive all the way around. Now consider some specific effects on men. Pornography gives men a new standard of beauty. You see, when men view pornography, they're viewing only the most attractive model, the best that this industry can offer. Thus, men become less attracted to, quote, average people. This causes a man to rate women based upon physical features alone that are portrayed in these videos and other pornographic material. Obviously, this is shaped by a fictional standard. You can cover up a whole lot with makeup and plastic. And when you view this, you develop a false fictional standard. And that's exactly what occurs with men who do this. In 2008, the journal Neural Mage published a study that found when men viewed pornographic material, mirror neurons in the brain would also fire. What exactly is a mirror neuron? Well, I'm glad you asked. Have you ever seen someone get hit by a ball? Maybe get hit in the head or some other part of their body? And when you see that, you recoil? That's your mirror neurons firing. Your brain causes you to think that you yourself are the one who just got hit. When it comes to pornography... The brain naturally imagines the viewer as being a part of those scenes. Thus, a man is not only viewing this material, but the brain makes it to where he is also a main character in those scenes. Ultimately, this trains men to receive personal validation, not from real life relationships, but from pixels on a screen. The more of this type of material that is viewed, the more the brain looks like an addict's brain. In 2014, Cambridge scientists discovered that the brains of habitual viewers of pornography showed similarities between those brains of alcoholics. In an MRI machine, it was noted that the ventral striatum, it's a portion of the brain that of the habitual porn viewer, this portion of the brain was noticed to light up just the same as an alcoholic's brain lights up when that person sees beverage alcohol. Ultimately, this will lead to loss of willpower. These men, quote, needed to view more and more of the pornography in order to reach the same high that was once experienced, just like various other drugs. Eventually, you build up a tolerance. You have, you have to start taking more in order to get the same high you did at one point prior. So you have to start taking more of the drug. Pornography works the same way. Pornography makes violence against women more appealing. Why do feminists support pornography? I will never understand. According to research conducted by Dr. Dolph Zillman and Dr. Jennings Bryant, the more one views pornography, the more likely one is to trivialize rape. In their experiments, those that viewed pornography on a regular basis were willing to cut the sentencing of accused rapist nearly in half compared to those who did not view pornography at all. Viewers of pornography also believe that such practices as sadomasochism are two to three more times or two to three times more common in general society. As we said, this plays on the fact that it alters that individual's reality or the perception of it. 
while consuming pornography does not make most people sexually violent, it does train men to embrace the objectification of women. Viewing these images and material makes men think as women as play toys. Why is that considered a good thing in this society and any part of the world? Clearly, pornography is a damaging agent. It ensnares and alters the mind of the viewer. Thus, it is a form of idolatry. $3,000 a day goes to spending money on pornography. Think about how much money that is. You wouldn't need stimulus checks if you save that money. But instead, we want to give our money to this form of idolatry. Pornography causes a warped view of reality. It brings about unrealistic expectations in relationships. As a result of that, you have one or both partners feeling inadequate. Pornography brings the objectification of men and women alike. After all, if they're just playing parts on the screen, it's like an, a shiny new toy. When it gets old, you throw it out and get a new one. I was told that example when uh, speaking about marriage. Eh, wife is getting old, I'll just trade her in for a new model. That's not the proper attitude to have. Pornography destroys marriages and homes. And it can also lead to other sins. Think about the, th the different things that are around this type of sin. Black market auctions for buying people. We were talking about slavery in this morning's Bible class. That sort of thing goes on. This is a money-making business, and people are going to do whatever they can to make as much money as they can. Now, what does the Bible have to say about pornography? You know, we've spent quite a, few t quite a bit of time talking about secular views on it. And if that isn't enough, the Bible should be enough for you. So what does it say about pornography? Well, first and foremost, the term pornography is not actually used in the Bible. However, the principles are there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, we're told to flee fornication. There's one of our terms. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So it's in a little bit of a different class. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In each of these terms, in each of these verses, the word flee means to run away, to shun, to escape or vanish from. That's exactly what we should be doing to fornication, whether it's written or it's the, the physical act. Because remember our term, pornography, written, prostitution. We should be fleeing from these things. Now speaking to the addictive nature of pornography, we must obviously beware. As Christians, we must not be held under the influence or under the power of any substance. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? 
For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Excuse me, spirit. And then 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought in bondage. Next, speaking of the destructive nature of pornography, consider the writings of Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 through 29. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man make fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals, and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Consider also Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 30, and Ephesians chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. Jesus also warns us about using our imaginations for evil. He notes, points out, Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, that fornications come from the heart. He elaborates a little more on this in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30, which there he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and that not thy whole body should, ca should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. And cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and that and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Then we see God's attitude toward pornography and fornication. Galatians chapter five verse nineteen reads Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, and lasciviousness. And then pick back up in verse 21, the latter part of it. I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they that which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Reference also Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. People who are engaged in this activity will not see heaven if they do not repent of it in this life. Now, considering all these different things that we've discussed, how are we to guard ourselves against pornography? First and foremost, it requires a disciplined mind. If you look around, we've got several generations of weak-minded individuals. We go purely upon our emotions. We're swayed by any kind of thought the wind might carry. We think that everything is owed to us. We don't have to put in the adequate amount of work to earn whatever we want. I used to be in powerlifting. If I wanted to pick up heavy weights, I had to pick up some weights. And eventually, you got stronger. People want to be able to max out the most weight, but they don't want to put in the, the work to get there. So we must be able to discipline our minds. Seeing these provocative scenes can happen at any time. Go to Walmart. It happens all day. Back behind us, 
there's a place called Splashtown. And oftentimes they use our parking lot to, to stop in and park their vehicle and then they'll walk over. As the one who attempts to mow the grass here, if I look up and there's these naked people walking across the parking lot, I've just been exposed to walking pornography. We had a sermon recently about biblical modesty, pertaining specifically to our dress, our dress code. You see, each of us are walking billboards. The clothes that we choose to wear say something about us. If we're walking around naked, as the Bible says we're naked, we sin, we're walking porn pornography. And we're listening others to either think it's acceptable in our lives, which it is to some extent, we're also allowing the room to be for lust on the person who's viewing us. Now, being exposed to pornography, just as other sins, does not necessarily mean that we ourselves are in sin. What determines the sin is our response to that moment. In Scripture, we're given at least two examples of desperate housewives. First, Bathsheba and Potiphar's wife. Second Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. And it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. As individuals were able to perceive beauty. That's where it should have ended. However, verse 3, David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? He even had a second chance. Verse 4, And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. David had two opportunities to turn from that, and he chose not to. Contrast this with the response of Joseph, Genesis chapter 39, verses 10 through 12. And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that is Potiphar's wife, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. If you want to look at it through the terms of the world, Joseph had the perfect opportunity to fornicate with this woman. Nobody was around. He was second only to Potiphar. But what did he do? When confronted with pornography and this evil woman, he fled. He got himself out of that situation. <coughs> now, in order to do these things, it requires that we know our own limitations, our own, our own weaknesses. Thus, we need to be able to remove our, ourselves from these situations. We must instead have the same attitude as Job, Job chapter 31, verse 1. Secondly, we must know where God places the fulfillment of these God-given desires. The drive for intimate companionship is a God-given desire. We must realize this. This was noted by Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. It was reinforced by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. And is expanded upon in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. There's a time and a place for that. And it's limited to only the marriage union. Then we must seek to implement 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 and Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. By keeping our thoughts on pure things, we will not have time to think about anything that is contrary 
to the will of heaven. And finally, we must strive to implement what we typically call the golden rule. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. As a married man, would we want our wife on full display after this manner? As a father of a daughter, would you want your daughter on display after this manner? As a brother, would you want your sister on full display after this manner? Why then would we pursue such evil activity? And the same would apply for women. Would you want your husband on full display before everyone? Sisters, do you want your brother being viewed at like that? As we draw this lesson to a close, I think we have very plainly pointed out that pornography is a rank sin. It is disgusting. It is a detriment to society at large. And more importantly, it is a detriment to one's soul. James chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. As Christians, we must continually guard ourselves against this great sin. As parents, we must teach our children how to grow godly in this life into being godly men and godly women. And then demand that they search for the same qualities in those future spouses. As members of the Lord's army, though we're in the world, we must strive not to be of the world. Keeping in mind, though, that this wickedness is all around us, we must not succumb to its destructive appeal. Furthermore, realizing that everyone engaged in this sin needs the same saving gospel that we once obeyed, just as everyone else does. It is this gospel that properly obeyed and properly studied can and will cleanse and bring ultimately salvation to the hearer and the obeyer. Belief in Christ as the Son of God, repenting of one's sins, confessing Christ before others, and ultimately being baptized for the remission of sins accomplishes just that. One who has complied with these terms of pardon is now a Christian and also in a covenant relationship with their Creator. If you have not taken these steps, why not? Why not take them today? Now, if you've already done so, but you've allowed sin back into your life, why not have it removed through repentance, confession, and prayer? Whether you're guilty of the sin we've talked about this morning, that is pornography, or any other sin, sin is the only thing going to keep us out of heaven. What is your view towards that sin? Do you hate it? You should. If you hate it, why not take the necessary steps to remove it from your life? Whatever... Each of those two needs might be in your life. Please make it known as together we stand and sing.